All right, let's do a chalk talk about BVR intercept timelines. BVR, of course, means beyond visual range. So for the purposes of this episode, we are in a section of F14Bs, and our Rios have the standard TID. So this is circa, let's just say, 92-93 time frame. Our airplanes are loaded 2x2x2, two by two by two, which means two Sidewinders, two Sparrows, two Phoenix. Our Phoenix are the AIM-54C. Our mission, fleet air defense. So it's sort of the top gun scenario. Our allowable risk is high, meaning we need to kill bandits. We will sacrifice a $42 million Tomcat to save a $3 billion aircraft carrier, for instance, if it comes to that. Weapon status. The Admiral Alpha Bravo has said, weapon status is red and free, meaning we can commit missiles meeting the rest of the PID criteria. And speaking of PID, which is positive identification criteria, for the purposes of this BVR timeline, our PID criteria is met. The E-2 has given us that information. We're being controlled by an organic E-2 Hawkeye. The threat we're going against Four fifth-generation fighters. They have medium-range forward-quarter weapons. All right, let's go to the training aids. So, yes, these are Hornets. Pretend like they're Tomcats. We're on our cap station waiting for tasking from the E-2. We're listening to the E-2 as they build the radar picture. And at some point, we get a vector from the E-2 range and bearing, and the order to commit. So for the purposes of this timeline, let's say we need that no less than 50 nautical miles. Fighters bring nose on. Rios start to build the radar picture in accordance with their pre-briefed search contracts. So somebody's looking medium to high, radar skewed left, Somebody's looking medium to low and radar skewed right with overlap in the middle. Rios, get your display set up so the range scale has targets building in the upper third and your azimuth gates are not wide open. The other thing that's key, and this is the difference between killing bandits or not, is we want to make sure we have calm brevity. We don't want to have a lot of extraneous communications either between airplanes or in the cockpit. The between airplanes part happens at this part of the timeline. The in cockpit part happens post-merge in the event that there are any leakers and you wind up having to dogfight. So for now, as we sort, we want to hear a premium of comms. So for instance, we're sorting in accordance with the pre-briefed contracts. This is why briefs, especially the Rio part, has got to be very detailed and absolutely in the weeds about what you're going to do in the event you see whatever shape formation coming at you. So let's say we have this four plane coming at us in a box, which is a standard Soviet era formation. So our sort would be a side sort. So let's say our flight lead is on the left, wings on the right. So pictures built. Ideally, all the lead Rio has to say is sorted, and then the wing would answer sorted. If you needed to take it one step more than that, then you'd say sorted left, sorted right. Maybe they're showing you a lead trail. Then you say sorted lead, sorted trail. And at that point, we're committing our first Phoenix missile. So this is a sample data active shot, shot in track while scan. So... Fox 3, Fox 3, those missiles climb up to 80,000 feet, and then they go active in the end game. A pole, which is the range at which the missile goes active, meaning the Tomcats don't have to support it with radar energy anymore, is nominally 32 miles. So in the event that they get tipper information and you see those tracks start to extrapolate, meaning you're seeing an X over your track while scan track, then 
the missile should be able to guide to impact. But even more important than A-pole is F-pole, the range at which the missiles hit. So for a 40-mile Phoenix shot, nominally F-pole would be at 28 miles. So let's assume, because we're using AIM 54Cs, that the first two missiles hit their targets. So at that point, as the wingmen watch their two leads blow up, and remember, the Phoenix is coming top down, so unless they're looking up and maybe they'll see contrails, they won't see this missile coming. So the wingmen are just flying along, and all of a sudden their leads blow up, so they're probably going to jump into the beam. So at 25 miles, let's say, the wing bandits will jump into the beam. So at this point, Rios have got to practice radar mode agility. Don't just sit there and track while scan and watch your contacts extrapolate and go away. Now, you're going to pulse search. And in pulse search, you want to keep a nice picture painted. Now the Rios are talking to each other maybe a little more about what is it you're seeing. Maybe get in a lock to get good range information and get your pilot diamonds in the HUD. But then break that lock again and keep painting the picture. Okay, this is where the Rios make their money. Then... Nominally, at 20 miles, these bandits are coming nose on again. So another assumption here is we're going against a varsity enemy. These aren't the Libyans in 1989. Yes, their flight leads blew up, but these wingmen are going to keep coming at us. So at 20 miles, they're nose on again. So now we're looking to reestablish track while scan tracks or going into PD search for quick locks Keep those diamonds in the HUD as much as we can so our pilots can start to get the early tallies. All right, now this is the most important guts ball part of a BVR timeline, and this is where the Rios definitely make their money. So since I said we're going against fifth-generation fighters with medium-range forward-quarter weapons, we have to honor that threat. So regardless of how beautiful your radar picture is, inside of 20 miles, you're going to dump it so that you don't get shot in the face. That's called the notch. So nominally at 17 miles, you're going to go into the notch. The other thing you would look to verify with respect to going into the notch is you're probably getting spiked, meaning they have a lock. Your radar warning indicator shows an air-to-air -air spike, and so you'd make that call. Mooch is spiked at 12. Notching. So the notch, very aggressive 90 degree turn, max G's, unloading, getting the threat on the wing line, blowing out chaff. Hopefully the missiles would guide on the chaff. And then one potato, two potato, we're coming back in. Now at this point, the Rios have got to have their radars pointed in the right piece of sky. So this is Varsity Rio work. So what we used to do is practice notching in a 1v1 scenario. So you get to 20 miles, 17 miles, notch, unload, and this guy would do whatever he wanted. And this is a real challenge for the Rio. So maybe he'd do a split S and dive down and lose 10,000 feet. So when you come out of the notch, now the Rio's trying to find the bandit, looking in all kinds of pieces of the sky. It's a real tough problem. But again, this is where Rios make their money. So what I used to do is I'd come out and pulse search, look in the piece of sky that I thought the bandit was based on where he was before he went in the notch. If I didn't see it, I'd go to PD search and I'd move the antenna more aggressively. So now you're getting into short range. You know, we're, we're closing at 2,500 knots here. 13 miles, hopefully once again you're sorted and you're going single target track. So now we're looking at committing sparrows. So what you want to avoid coming out of the notch is both Rios locking the same target. Obviously, if you shoot two sparrows at the same bandit, one's going to hit and the other's going to hit the fireball and now you've left one guy alive when you should have killed both. So the way to avoid that and again, comms have got to be brief, concise, 
and accurate. So for instance, coming out of the notch, lead reel has a lock, wing reel has a lock, lock 360 at 10, lock 005 at 11. So now you know you've got different bandits locked up, and Fox 1, Fox 1, it's goodness. But in most cases, you'll take what you can get in the heat of battle. Remember, this is happening so quick. And many times you come out of the notch and you don't have anything. So now the pilots are eyes out, trying to get a tally. And way too often, by this point, you're at the merge. But let's imagine, now, we did have good locks. We shot two good Fox 1s. Boom. Problem's over. All four dead. But Fox. what if... That's not the case. Okay, so at 10 miles, we're at Fox 1 F pole, so we'll see bandits explode or not. The other thing that happens, and this is why you want a lock, because in the F-14, when you have a radar lock, the pilot gets a diamond in the HUD over the bandit. So that directs his eyes in the right piece of sky. Otherwise, you're just looking for black specks out there, and that's suboptimum. So we get our tallies, we'll know, you know, splash however many out of the notch. So let's imagine if somebody survives or both of them survive, now we're getting into the forward quarter sidewinder arena. And let's just say again, two, two, and two, and our sidewinders are aim nine mics. So that's got a forward quarter capability. So we'll take whatever face shots of opportunity we can get before the merge. Now at the merge, lead pilot has to make the call. Are you going to bug out or are you going to engage? So that decision is by and large a function of what is the bandit showing you at the merge. So if he's got max angles on you, you have no choice but to engage. If he takes you 180 out, then best move is probably unload, bug, listen to the E2 controller giving you range and bearing. Because the other problem is you've got to go back to the ship. You can't just bug 180 out from where you need to return, but you can bug, establish distance, hold him off, rope a dope, get headed back to the ship, and return to fight another day. Or if need be, because he's run you down, or again, he has angles, now you have to get into the dogfighting arena. But ideally, you'd never get there. And the F-14's advantage is the long-range forward quarter weapons capability, particularly the Phoenix. So use your advantage to your advantage. So the analogy that I like to use is air-to-ground warfare is football and air-to-air -air warfare is hockey. What I mean by that is air-to-ground warfare is chart prep, hitting your IP, hitting all the waypoints, and complying with the delivery profile. It's very structured. Air-to-air -air warfare is like hockey in that the plays aren't as structured as football. It flows more, and you assess what you, what you have and, and adjust. That's the way the very dynamic, high-entropy world of air-to-air -air warfare is. But like a good hockey team, you need to create structure out of chaos. And that's what a good BVR timeline should do. You've got to brief it. You've got to practice it. Again, those 1v1 drills are great in terms of notching and coming out of the notch and acquiring the bandit. Because a Tomcat pilot with a diamond in his HUD is a lot more dangerous than one who doesn't have a diamond in his HUD. And that's the Rio's job to get him that diamond. But those who follow these techniques will emerge victorious. All right, that'll do it for this episode. As always, if you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell. Give me the likes. Likes are very important. Comment. I love the comments, and as you've seen, I like to engage as much as I can. Also, check out the links below for merch and where to get my debut novel, Punk's War. Use the checkout code PUNKYT, P-U-N-K-Y-T, at checkout for discounts on Punk's War for subscribers. And if you'd like to help us take the channel to the next level, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.